Konnichiwa, minasan. Today we conclude the background history behind the Shogun series. The link to part one is on screen now. Toyotomi Hideyoshi has succeeded where his master failed, victoriously uniting the warring daimyos of Japan. His rivals have either sworn their allegiance or they have been destroyed. Despite this now fledgling peace, Hideyoshi must now decide what to do with this nation of warriors. Japan has been at war for over a century. By this time, several generations who have known nothing but warfare. Hideyoshi had successfully ended this nightmare for Japan, but with a society who knew nothing but war, the question is, what do you do with this enormous military machine who now has no enemy? With this in mind, Hideyoshi commits to a bold and outlandish plan, one that he hopes will make him the most powerful man in Asia. China is perceived as the center of the world for feudal Japan. Even the way it is written in Japanese kanji demonstrates this. Chu meaning center and Goku meaning country. For Hideyoshi, he cannot conceive of a greater target than conquering China, for the success of this goal would make him the greatest warlord in history. Hideyoshi realizes that in order to get to China, he would first need to march through Korea. As a courtesy, and perhaps overly ambitiously, he elects to write to the Koreans for permission to pass through their country. It's important to note that there was a lasting bad relationship between these two countries. Japan had actually invaded Korea centuries before, which had yet to be forgotten. Subsequently, the Koreans deny Hideyoshi's request and refuse to allow him to simply walk through their country. In part, this was also due to the Koreans' close ties and trade relations with China. Hideyoshi did not take this refusal lying down, and now instead set his sights on punishing Korea for what he saw as an unacceptable response, an action he naively believed to be simple, but would soon come to regret. The year is 1592. The undertaking of the invasion of Korea was probably one of the most complicated military logistic challenges ever to take place world over. This invasion involved as many as 200,000 men, something the world would not see again until the D-Day invasion in World War II. Setting sail across the Korean Strait from the island of Tsushima, through sheer numbers they quickly took the port city of Busan and then began moving north, taking the key cities of Seoul and Pyongyang. Hideyoshi's campaign had seen horrendous atrocities across the Korean peninsula. They ruthlessly kill surrendering garrisons and murder civilians without distinction. This was cruelty on an unprecedented scale. Against these tides of horror, in almost every corner of Korea, common people began to rise up and fight back against the invaders. One of the most notable leaders of these forces was named Gwak Jae Yu, a very wealthy man who is told to have sold most of his possessions in order to provide arms for his soldiers. Supposedly, his red coat was dyed in the menstrual blood of virgins, so that it provided magical protection against his enemies. The main tactics of these guerrilla fighters was to attack the supply lines of the Japanese forces. This was a viable strategy, as the Japanese could only resupply by ferrying across the dangerous waters of the Korean Strait, and then up the length of Korea, where they were most vulnerable. Other opportunities arose as the Japanese placed spikes across the rivers to signal to their men where it was safe to cross. This provided the intelligence in which to place surprise attacks. As the Japanese began to cross the river with their heavy armor weighing them down, the righteous armies would at that moment spring the attack, 
launching volleys of bullets and arrows as the Japanese stood helpless, resulting in a massacre evidenced by the sways of samurai corpses washing downstream. The first Korean victory of the war happened this very way, on the Nam River, providing the Koreans with huge confidence, instilling the notion that the samurai were not invincible and they could indeed drive the invaders back. The domino effect of this victory spurred even more ordinary people to join the cause and the Japanese faced a country of total warfare. Night attacks and arson decimating their camps. Everything they could lay their hands on in terms of military ingenuity. Before long, supply lines, riverboats and communications were under constant attack which significantly damaged the morale of the invading force and severely hindered their progress. To aid the Korean efforts, China's Ming Dynasty sent troops to Korea to thwart the Japanese advance, which despite epic battles resulted in a stalemate with both sides unable to gain ground. Back in Japan, Hideyoshi was mostly left in the dark of the negative developments. Hideyoshi was a ruthless dictator, making him angry could result in the loss of your life. Because of this, many of his vassals did not want to deliver him bad news, and would instead sugarcoat the progress being made in Korea. Therefore, Hideyoshi became completely out of touch with the real situation and the scale of this disaster. However, there was another problem at the forefront of his mind. Hideyoshi had dreams of creating a great dynasty, but currently had no heir to call his own. In order to continue his lineage, he would need a successor, without which his legacy would come undone. At this point, his wife, Lady Nena, had not had any children and was now too old to become pregnant. He did, however, have hundreds of concubines in Osaka one of which he rationalised could produce him a son. In steps Lady Chacha, Hideyoshi's favourite concubine. She was also the niece of Oda Nobunaga, the man who Hideyoshi had taken over from, which would provide their child much more legitimacy. After years of trying, Lady Chacha gave birth to a son, but the boy would unfortunately die soon after, leaving Hideyoshi again without an heir. Feeling more and more isolated, and with the Korean War still raging, becoming desperate, Hideyoshi announced his nephew as his heir. But this decision would not last long. A surprise was in store for Hideyoshi. Again, Lady Chacha gave birth to another son who would live. He was named Hideyori. Having created another predicament of the heir he had named and the son he now wished to be his successor, Hideyoshi forced his nephew into exile. Although still feeling this did not protect his new son's future, he resolved in executing his nephew, alongside 30 other members of his close family. Meanwhile, the Japanese forces in Korea are still bogged down, fighting a seemingly unwinnable war, lacking food and supplies, and combating not just guerrilla fighters, but also illness and disease. Unaware of the true nature of his army on the ground, Hideyoshi continues to order his men to advance. The generals in Korea, receiving increasingly bizarre orders from Japan, begin to realise that Hideyoshi's mental state had become more and more unstable. With tens of thousands of Japanese lives lost and countless more Koreans, the disastrous situation leads the commanders on the ground to begin opening up negotiations to try and reach a resolution. The issue here is Hideyoshi believed that he was winning the war and therefore had a strict set of terms in which he would be happy to withdraw. The minimum required Korea to be divided into two spheres of influence, a southern state presided over by Japan and a northern state by China. Moreover, he sought for the leader of the Ming Dynasty to deliver one of their own daughters to Japan to become his concubine. There was no way the Ming Emperor was going to deal on these terms, 
After all, the truth being he had basically lost in Korea, the Ming Emperor sent an envoy to Japan with very different terms. When the Chinese envoy reached Hideyoshi's court, they presented him with Chinese robes. Believing it to be a gift of submission, Hideyoshi was at first pleased until he unraveled the letter from the Chinese Emperor. The letter outlined that the Ming Dynasty recognized Hideyoshi as the King of Japan and as such welcomed him as their vassal. Now, realizing the gifts he had received were actually a sign of his own submission, Hideyoshi fell into a rage, throwing the Chinese out and now bent on revenge. Blood drunk and consumed with anger, he ordered a second invasion of Korea, but this time his goals were much more limited. He sought only blood and began an even more brutal campaign. Needless to say, this didn't go well, and the second invasion was again stopped by the Korean and Chinese armies, forcing the Japanese back to their coastal garrisons. The Japanese daimyos had become increasingly dissatisfied with the bad decisions and constant defeats and were now openly talking of rebellion. However, by this point, Hideyoshi was gravely unwell and even found it difficult to leave the confines of his castle. Now, his only concern was the continuation of his lineage. However, his son, Hideyori, was far too young to take the throne. His mind filled with memories of the civil war when heirs were swiftly murdered to enable the transfer of power. He decided on a solution to this worry. He would enact a policy that he hoped would protect his legacy. After his death, the country would be governed by a council of five elders, who will also watch over his son until he was of age to take his rightful place as the ruler of Japan. The men he picks for this are the five most powerful men across all of Japan. Some of these men Hideyoshi has had a long history with and he trusts. Others are chosen simply because of their power and not because he trusts or likes them. The intent of this selection was that daimyos who quite clearly had competing interests with each other would ensure that each member would watch each other closely and no one member would become more powerful than the other four. That inward tension would thus protect his son until the right time. The two most significant members of this council being Tokugawa Ieyasu and Maeda Toshiie. Maeda Toshiie would be positioned in Osaka Castle and would be responsible for raising Hideyori, managing his education and preparing for leading the country. Ieyasu was given the overall authority and basically put in charge of the entire government side of the council. These are the two rival daimyos which the series' political turmoil is based around. Their names have been changed, Ieyasu becoming Toranga Yoshi and Meida Toshiie changed to Ishiro Kazunari. This is the period where the book and series begin to tell the story of an English sailor who shipwrecks off the coast of Japan and his journey through the politics and culture of the 17th century. It's here where his viewers begin our tour of feudal Japan in the upcoming series. As I said in my previous video, I have had to condense and totally ignore some parts of the history, but these videos were just to give you a wide understanding of the backgrounds before the events in the series. I hope you've enjoyed this journey through Japanese history and if you'd like to see more videos exploring the history of Japan, please let me know down in the comments. For now, I'm sure you're as excited for the series as I am and if you've made it this far, you might consider throwing this channel's shogun some support and help grow his empire by liking and subscribing. Ja minasan, kyo wa tanoshikatta da ne, kiyotsukette ne, sayonara!